What's up Neanderthals, this is Ayub and today we're gonna know all about session hijacking. What do you say about someone in a room inside of which exists all kinds of private stuff that belongs to that person and then all of a sudden they decide to leave the room for a moment and come back and because the process of opening the door and closing it is daunting due to the security measures, they thought leaving the door open for a short while is not a big deal. So they open the door and leave. And immediately after they disappear, the burglar that have waited so long for this moment enters the room, steals valuable stuff, displaces everything and wrecks havoc and then disappears. This is an extreme case where the person will be able to recognize something changed or a lot of things actually in his room. But what if the burglar takes pictures of personal information or other things that would be of value to the burglar or the one who hired them. Well, if you think this someone is unlucky, you should know about the one who has his web session hijacked. So in this lesson, we're gonna learn about sessions. We're gonna see what is session hijacking and how it works. We'll dive into types of session hijacking and we'll of course talk about some prevention measures. Let's dive in folks. So session hijacking is a lot like what happened to the unlucky fellow in the story. As our use and existence in the web increase, we find ourselves customers and users of many online services that range from entertainment to shopping to education to name a few. And what we wish in this case is to have a smooth and seamless web experience. We don't want to log in every time we want to perform an action, right? For this to happen, we need a mechanism whereby browsers and application servers can trust each other and communicate on our behalf. One way to do this is through sessions. All right, so what is a session? A session is the time you stay active using a website. It is a technique used for servers to keep track of who you are during a period while using a website. And that's because HTTP is stateless. As you know, HTTP is the protocol of the web. And if you want to know more about HTTP and how the web works, you can visit my other lessons about HTTP and the web. You will find the links below. Okay, so while the session is active, every request from your browser will be identified as coming from you. Otherwise, every time you make a new request, you have to tell the server, hey, it's me again. And here is my personal ID. This is not a good way to serve the web. And there is no way the server could know when you're done with a website. So the session terminates either by you logging out or through an experiential mechanism. We'll talk about that in security measures. It's worth noting that we need sessions because as we said, HTTP is tasteless. It is built not to keep information about users. So sessions help us associate requests to other requests. Without sessions, if you are on the Facebook news feed page and want to visit your profile, you would have to log in again. And that would be super cumbersome. Wait, huh? You know what? I have just realized the session feature is the reason behind Facebook and social media addiction. Had sessions never existed, we would be living in a better world now. <laughs> That's wow. HTTP actually is a perfect flawless protocol. It's just beyond compare. Anyway, when you first log into a web app, you certainly log in using your username and password, right? The server may use this info along with other stuff to generate a unique ID or a key and pass it back to the web browser. And this marks the start of a session. The ID is what further requests will use to authenticate you and talk to the server. And of course, this ID is called the session ID. Now, you know, we don't live in an ideal world, right? So what we'll talk about next is the dark side of human beings. Great. So attackers have several tricks under their sleeve to compromise systems, steal sensitive data and perform malicious actions. We've already seen a bunch of attacks they use. Session hijacking is one of them. In this type of attack, a hacker fools the website into thinking they are you and can then do anything you could do on the site. Hackers know how servers make use of session IDs to identify users. So they will try to find ways to steal those IDs or even find ways to trick users to use IDs that they have control over, which is called session fixation. Session hijacking is any way an attacker can gain control over a user's session without their knowledge. Now, to understand how session hijacking works, we have to understand a couple of things, right? First, browsers keep track of session keys that are used to identify users. Document.cookie is an attribute that contains all cookies and you can read and write values in the document.cookie using JavaScript. And second thing, is that communication over the internet is done through packets of information. 
When we send an HTTP request to the server, the data is text. It gets divided into packets and sent to the destination. And we need a way to safely get the data to the destination. Unfortunately, not all settings are safe, and sometimes the network through which data is sent is not safe, such as unsecured Wi-Fi hotspots. Another important thing to know is that both servers and browsers keep track of session keys and there could be many ways to access the storage files and databases on both ends if security measures are not in place. Now, attackers know all this stuff and more, and this gives them a lot of options to hijack users' sessions. All right, so before I talk about specific types of session hijacking, keep in mind that there are three major ways to steal a valid session ID. First is, of course, guessing a valid session key through brute force. And second is creating a valid session key and tricking the user into using it as their own. And the third is stealing a valid session key from the client or the server. All right, so the first type I wanna talk about is session hijacking through cross-site scripting. If you don't know much about this attack, you can visit my short video about it. Cross-site scripting is a way to inject code into websites so that when the application is active or the page is loaded, the code executes. Usually it's JavaScript and an attacker could simply inject code that reads the document that cookie key value pairs and sends the data to the hacker's server. This is the most common and possibly the most dangerous type of session hijacking attacks. The attacker first finds a vulnerability on the server or client side, then they inject malicious code into the website. How could the attacker inject code is another story. They could do it through input form, through links, etc. And again, if you want a detailed explanation about this, you can find it in the cross-site scripting video lesson. And of course, if there is no sanitization of input, the attacker could easily get the session key. So what would usually happen is that the attacker finds a cross-site scripting vulnerability in a web app. They inject malicious code that would read and steal users' session keys. Now that the trap has been set, right? When a user logs into the web app, the server identifies the user, creates and sends a session key to the user's browser upon successful authentication. Unfortunately, at this moment, the injected code is waiting for the user to log in. Once that happens, the victim's browser executes the JavaScript code and the attacker hijacks the session after they get the session key. Not a happy story, right? Anyway, the second type is called sidejacking. This is just a fancy way to describe a hacking technique called man-in-the-middle attack. This technique is used to get the session key through sniffing. The attacker could easily get involved in the communication between the server and the browser of the user if the client side is using an insecure network. So through packet sniffing, the attacker could observe the communication between the server and the client and intercepts the session cookie when the user authenticates on the server. Hackers take advantage of websites that use SSL TLS encryption only for the login step and not for the entire session to perform this type of attack. And of course, as we said, unsecured Wi-Fi spot help a lot. So when the attacker receives the desired packet, they can have access to the user's active session and impersonate them to do nefarious things. Yep, another sad story. And there is a couple more, but the good news is that we will learn how to stop these types of stories and create happy ones. Most of the time, of course. So keep watching. Okay. Session hijacking using malware or malicious software is another way to obtain valid session keys. When a user clicks a malicious link that would trigger a download of a malicious software, the malware gets downloaded and installed on the client's or the user's computer. Once in the victim's system, it may use network sniffing for web-based messages to detect session data and send them to the perpetrator. The malware could also access the local storage file for the browser to fetch session cookies. All right, so this is another type of session hijacking. And I have a couple more, but these last two types are classified as as session fixation and session prediction, respectively. Session fixation is a slightly different type of attack in that the hacker begins the attack before the user logs in. Actually, the attacker will have a valid session key at their disposal and tries to induce or force the victim into logging in to the desired website using the session ID injected by the attacker. There are 
many ways to perform this type of attack. HTTP query parameters is one way to pass the valid session key to the victim. The link will take the victim to a login form and upon successful authentication, the injected session ID will be used to identify the user for further requests. The attacker now can hijack the victim's session and do all sorts of nefarious things. The technique used to fix that the session ID will depend on how the application handles sessions. It could be as simple as sending a malicious URL or the attacker might have to create a fake website with a login form that will contain the session key hidden. Cross-site scripting could be used to change the session cookie or manipulate HTTP header values as well. And finally, the attacker could resort to brute force to guess or predict the session key. Plenty of tools would help to achieve that. This technique is possible if the website uses a weak mechanism to create session IDs. Using short predictable IDs will make it easy for the attacker to guess the session key. Generally, these are the main types of session hijacking. Diving deeper in these attacks is beyond the scope of this video, but this should give you a fair idea about session hijacking vulnerabilities. All right, so session hijacking is the result of insufficient web security or and inappropriate session management. Now, let's talk how to turn the sad stories into happy ones. When it comes to protection measures against this type of attack, as a good practice, always check the validity of session IDs. Session keys range from expired to very old to duplicate, and there should be a mechanism through which a session key is checked and validated. Also, do not not accept session identifiers from post and get requests. This is just a good opening for hackers to fixate session IDs. Sweet. Now, there are a couple of things that can be done to lower the chance for user sessions to be hijacked. First, use HTTPS for all traffic. And that means session traffic as well. Using TLS SSL for all your traffic ensures the hacker cannot intercept the plain text session ID. Take a look at the HTTP strict transport policy to know more about this. Second, setting the HTTP header set cookie to HTTP only will prevent access to cookies from client-side scripts. Feel free to watch the protection measures section in the cross-site scripting video to learn more about other security measures concerning cross-site scripting based attacks. All right, so third protection measure is to regenerate the session ID after initial login. At least this will prevent session fixation attacks. And speaking of changing the session key, setting a reasonable session ID expiration date is a good practice to make sure you don't have valid session keys forever. Another security measure is using secure frameworks and libraries for session ID generation and management. Community verified and proven libraries are just stronger and more secure than implementing your own session management logic. So yeah, that was a lot of information. You might feel overwhelmed and your head might want to explode now, but the good news is this is a video, you can repeat it, you can stop it, you can slow it down and take your time to really understand these things. So these are the major security measures taken to prevent session hijacking. Other important things to do and best practices are flagging session IDs as secure, re-authenticating users before important actions such as withdrawing money, changing passwords, etc. And you might be familiar with this process if you are a regular web user. Great. So this should be enough to implement an acceptable policy to secure user sessions. Of course, security depends on the type of the system and what is involved. The more complex the application is, the more vulnerabilities it has and the more protection it will need. All right, fellas, I enjoyed sharing with you my knowledge about session hijacking today. We've learned about sessions and session hijacking. We have seen types of attacks to gain access to valid session IDs. And of course, we talked about prevention measures. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new and don't forget to leave me a comment below if you have a question or suggestion or anything you can like and subscribe as well to show your appreciation that is if you want to until the next video stay fine and stay tuned